afternoon, universe, and welcome to Cross Defense, your weekly dose of knowing why you believe what you believe so that you will be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks for the hope that you have in the life, suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm your host, Pastor Jonathan Fisk, and today we continue our journey through the great Christian dogmatics of Dr. Francis Pieper, a text which ever so carefully lays down the clearest defense of the Christian faith just about ever penned, all founded on those marvelous Reformation principles of Scripture alone, grace alone, faith alone, of course, because it's all about Christ alone. St. Paul exhorts all Christians to hunger for the truth, to watch your life and doctrine closely, to persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourselves and your hearers. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but instead will turn aside to suit their own desires, gathering around them a great number of teachers to teach what their itching ears want to hear. But you, however, must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, and so encourage others. I have as guests today via phone some some dear friends special to my own heart because they are classmates of mine from 2006 graduating class Concordia Seminary St. Louis, uh, Reverend Jeffrey Reese, Senior Pastor of Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church of Tacoma, Washington, Pastor Timothy Winterstein of Faith Lutheran Church in East Wenatchee, Washington, and Pastor Matthew Gunia, um, whose notes I managed to not have here. Pastor uh, Gunia, I'm going to let you talk first. What name of your church again? Ascension Lutheran Church in Niles, Illinois. In Niles, Illinois, in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Hey there. Hey there, exactly. We have some good past with us. Uh, you know, you used to get together on Thursday evenings and uh, go over whatever was being said in our classes, whether we liked it or disliked it, and hash out as iron sharpens iron our thoughts as we went through the seminary process. And so there was a bit of a bond there, and hopefully we're going to be bringing you into that kind of a conversation, into that kind of thinking about particularly the doctrine of Holy Scripture. And but before we do that, uh, you know, this is the first round with these gentlemen. We hope to have them on again in the future. But would you guys each just tell me a little bit about where you are, uh, the, about the area that you're in, what makes it unique, and, and your congregation? So let's start with uh, Pastor Reese out in Tacoma, Washington. Yeah, well, um, Tacoma is uh, often associated with Seattle, and uh, generally speaking, people from Tacoma don't like that very much. We're actually... Uh, far enough away that we are our own metro area, um, certainly smaller. Um, I think we're the third largest city in Tacoma, or excuse me, in the state of Washington, right on Commencement Bay, which is part of Puget Sound. Um, beautiful area as far as mountains and salt water and so forth. Uh, lots of green. Um, a, a struggling area in terms of Christianity, of course. Um, a lot of people think that uh, it's important for us to do ministry differently out here than in the Midwest because everybody's Christian in the Midwest. But in fact, uh, one of the refreshing things uh, about uh, living out here is that the atheists out here are honest about their atheism, and so it actually makes for easier conversation. You know, I just read an article this morning, uh, I forget where the link was, but it, sh it was a study that was released that showed that congregations that make the gospel of Jesus and conservative theology the center of what they're doing currently are growing, and that congregations that have tried to do ministry differently, as you say, with something other than who Jesus is and what he's done in the scriptures, are, are shrinking. And this is a cross-denominational phenomenon. So it is kind of funny how people would say that, and yet, you know, if you're not going to give somebody something to believe, something worth believing, why would they join your church? Right. Pastor Winterstein, you're out there as well in the secular land of, uh, of Washington. Uh, what's it like for you in East Wenatchee? Yeah, uh, East Wenatchee is in—it's almost exactly in the center of the state, and uh, on but uh, but on the east side of the of the Cascade Mountains, in the Columbia Basin, and uh, beautiful, uh, surrounded by hills, and mountains, Columbia River, and uh, lots of orchards and lots of uh, agriculture, uh, mostly fruit, and uh, yeah, it's. Uh, uh, congregation uh in right in east wenatchee in a in a place where there are a lot of uh, pretty much any christian tradition you would want to could think of is is around the the wenatchee valley so uh it's a it's an interesting uh 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 place to be yeah uh, sure and uh pastor gunia out in in the great area around chicago uh really kind of an urban area right 
Yeah, and I also, my church is actually directly right across the street from Chicago. So across the street <laughs> from us, there's a lot of uh, Chicago cops, a lot of Chicago firefighters. There's a residency requirement for having those jobs. Um, we're, we're a suburban area, but we're kind of an urban area at the same time, kind of a transition suburb between what we, we think of as the green leafy suburbs and uh, just the nice neighborhood of Chicago. Uh, big immigrant populations here from, from Poland, from uh, some of the Middle Eastern countries, uh, interestingly enough, from Ukraine, um, uh, Thailand as well. So it's um, it's an interesting area to be in. The world at your doorstep. More That's and more right. the case in, in our cities in America. And, again, these, these two and a half diverse situations, not places that need a different gospel, not places that need a different scriptures, but places where the one truth of the scriptures do have a mark, right? And where people are seeking, coming to the word and the sacraments of Jesus Christ. So we're going to pick up with Dr. Peeper, where we left off with the Preuss brothers last week. Dr. Peeper had basically said, look, we're just going to come out and say this. And we know not everybody believes this, but but we, we Lutherans, we're, we're going to cling to Holy Scripture as God's book, right? As, as penned by men, but actually inspired by God and therefore without any error. And we didn't get to what was going to be, I think, my favorite quote in that entire section. So we're going to pick that up now where he says... We do not ask men to bear with us for taking this position. I I love the the kind of the snark there. He's like recognizing not everyone's going to be happy about this. We're not asking you to like that we're holding to Scripture alone. We're not even asking you to agree with us about holding to Scripture alone. We're just saying that if you're going to say we're doing what Christians have always done, well, then you're going to hold to Scripture alone. Thoughts on that, gentlemen? I think it's a I think it's a fascinating thing to to say and to kind of confess and to have something to 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 ground yourself in because you we see this happening all around us that the uh that uh when as soon as you as soon as you start to make distinctions and try to figure out okay is this part God's word in the Bible or is this part human word or whatever then then you are subjecting the scriptures to your own fallible human reason and uh that never ends well. Pastor Winterstein, Pastor Gunia? I find it interesting how he, he refuses to apologize for keeping the, uh, the traditions that have been handed down to us. We have the correct position. We'll tolerate you. We don't ask <laughs> that you're tolerating us. <laughs> Isn't that that uh, assurance that we have, one of the things that both uh, attracts people to conservative Lutheranism and then also repels them from conservative Lutheranism? Look at them thinking that they know the truth. Well, it's not that we have a a wisdom that uh, we have developed because of our German heritage or anything along those lines, but we have the truth because Christ has, as a gift, given to us the truth. Exactly. It's it's not that Lutherans know so much because we're Lutherans, and it's certainly not because we're we're German, or I'm sure some would say, they, they would say, you know, there's Norse uh, Lutherans too, there's Swedish Lutherans too, but you know, this Northwestern Anglo uh, heritage has nothing to do with any of that. It's simply trusting what Scripture is, which is what gives us the knowledge to know the truth. There's nothing inherent in us. What do you say, Pastor Reese? Well, a couple thoughts. One is that uh, a lot of a lot of people accuse Christians of, of being judgmental towards those who don't believe as they do, and, and certainly those Christians do exist. But what I find interesting is when I have conversations like this with people, and they're surprised to find out that I'm not really traumatized by the fact that they don't agree with me. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not, and I'm not even judging them. You know, I, I, I mean, certainly I, I have concern for people who do not believe in Christ and His Word, uh, and if I didn't it would mean I didn't love them you know but I don't lose sleep at night because I will because I couldn't argue somebody into the faith or because somebody didn't accept this uh, premise that indeed the the Word of God isn't is infallible and inerrant um, and then secondly it's interesting to read this uh, written by a guy who you know who lived through the turn of the 20th century and we think today as Christians as if this is a new problem Right. You know, and and yet the Enlightenment happened way back, you know, not just on the heels of the Reformation. Uh, and so this has been a problem for centuries now, and, and it's really nothing new. Um, I, I think we, we kind of glamorized the middle 20th century as this sort of, we have this sort of Christian utopia in America, which really isn't true. Uh, the, the difference is it just wasn't popular to be atheist, and so atheists 
kind of hid from the, you know, they, they didn't come out into the light uh, or they didn't admit their atheism. Um, but this, this problem has been around for centuries. There, there was this really unique historical blip. We talked about this two weeks ago where at this turn of the century when, when people is writing this, general Protestantism is liberalizing. And, and in that sense, it, it is no longer believing in sola scriptura as the sole source of, of truth and doctrine for the Christian life. But then there was this movement called evangelicalism, which essentially was lay people in these congregations saying, whoa, 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 we want our Bible. And so they, they came out of these churches. They formed new churches. The non-denominational movement is largely connected to this. And so they sort of made their new essence going back to Scripture, to the fundamentals of what the Scriptures teach. And this is where we think it's new, is that now we see those churches, right? The, those mm-hmm. non-bodies, and yet they they kind of are their own non-denominations, uh, going the same the same way. You mentioned traumatized by people not disagreeing with you. Now, I, I know that this is happening everywhere in the United States right now, especially in the wake of, of this fall's elections, but it must really be uh, sort of in the water out there in the Northwest that people are kind of traumatized by disagreement. I mean, is that really how you think people feel when they find out that, that you don't believe what they believe? Um, it happens. I mean, uh, I was even thinking about this uh, not long ago. Um there is a psychological term for, and, and, and it's escaping me now, uh, when uh, you you kind of operate on the assumption that everybody around you agrees with you on on things, and then you're kind of startled when you find out that friends of yours actually disagree. Um, and, and we all suffer from it to some degree or another. Uh, I wish I could remember the term, but it, 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 it's common for us to kind of, we go with these assumptions, and, and uh, we might even... Uh, we, we make we just make lots of assumptions about what people what other people think based upon other things we've heard them say. Um, when in reality, until we actually talk with them about the issue at hand, we can't know for sure. Right. Um, but it really doesn't. It really doesn't need to traumatize us or scare us or anything like that. And out here in this area, you know, I assume the person I'm talking to, if I've never seen them before, may very well be an atheist because because I'm I'm very heavily outnumbered as Christian. And, and I'm not, again, I don't lose sleep over it. I'm, I'm concerned for those people, to be sure, and I am always uh, appreciate the time that I get to share the gospel with, with them uh, as I'm given opportunity. Right. Um, but I, I trust the Holy Spirit. He's He's in charge of all of this. I'm just a, I'm just a bearer of the Word. Right. We're not the ones to make up the words. We're just the ones to confess what's been confessed. So exactly. so when Peeper says that... that we don't ask men to bear with us for taking this position, but we do insist that this is the only position one, meaning a, a Christian particularly, may take. While many people would consider that a closed-minded statement, it's almost like we're saying that the closed mind is the one that won't acknowledge this position to exist as an option for Christianity. Right. That, that's actually kind of, it, there's an interesting irony there. Winterstein, Gunia? You the foundational statement. If we can't agree on what the Word of God is and what we're going to draw the truth from, then when, where are we ever going to have agreement on things? Yeah, I, I think we see this when we're talking with uh, um, church bodies or, or Christians who don't hold this position. It's really hard to even have the discussion. I mean, you, you, you start talking... You start talking, and you say something like, I mean, I remember and bringing up Thursday nights. I remember a conversation we had with... Uh, a uh, seminarian from another tradition, uh, from another seminary in St. Louis, and asking what he thought or what he believed about what the crucifixion of Jesus actually accomplishes. And he said, almost word for word, these, these words, he said, well, there are different opinions about that. And I said, well, St. Paul seems to have an, op- <laughs> an idea of what that means. And he said, yeah, that's one of the opinions. So when you're it's almost impossible even to have a discussion then about you're you're set adrift in the in the sort of um sort of uh just ocean of your own thoughts and experiences and there's no mooring then there's no there's no anchor anywhere and uh and i at the time of the reformation uh even with the roman church kind of widening uh out from the scriptures and including a uh, sort of tradition that had been passed down uh, the the Lutherans and the Roman Catholics, and and later the Reformed, other Reformed could have a discussion, and they could ground their discussion in the Scriptures because they all believed this is the Word of God. 
they may have included other things within that uh, understanding of the Word of God, but they believed the Scriptures were the Word of God, and they didn't. Nobody was challenging that at that time, and it's 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 hard to have that discussion even with other Christians if you hold a different position about what the Scriptures actually are. Yeah, Gunya. I keep thinking about what Jeff had said earlier about when you're talking with someone and you're not bothered by the fact that they don't agree with you, and that's part of one of the nature of part of the nature of Scripture. It's living and it's active, and it doesn't return to God void, but it's dynamic and it has the ability to create faith. If I'm going away from the Scriptures, or I think that I found some kind of wisdom, or I need to relate to you some experience so that you can say, "Aha, I've had that too," and then finally agree with me, that puts a lot of pressure on me. Uh, to, to convince you by my wisdom or to, to uh, describe to you the details of some great, uh, compelling type of experience. But if you just speak the Word of God, recognizing that the Holy Spirit is in there uh, to create faith when and where He pleases, it, it's a very peaceful type of thing. Um, now, with regard to we must agree that the, the Word of God is the foundation uh, of everything, well, well that's it's the natural starting place where it determines what the rules are for debate, what the rules are for discussion, or what are your, even the topics of discussion. So if we don't have that as the thing that we agree on, that we're going to base our discussion based upon what the Scriptures teach us through the prophets and the apostles, then we're all just going to talk around in circles endlessly, and it's not going to be good for anyone. I, it reminds me a little bit of a struggle I had. This was, I guess, our first year. So 2007, you know, the little call I had out to New Jersey, and I was struggling with preaching because, and I don't know if they taught us this at seminary or if I just I just wasn't listening, but they, they taught us, I thought, or I was trying to take what was I was supposed to be preaching on, take the scriptures, and like find find the truth behind them, but then somehow find how it how it applied now in a different way. And, and I realized it was through a conversation with a mutual friend of ours, Pastor Rebau, uh, that I was effectively trying to prophesy. I was effectively trying to make the God, the Word of God new. I was trying to make it work. And, and this happened when I, I was talking with, with him on the phone and, and saying, I just, I'm not sure what to preach this weekend. And he was like, what do you mean? Don't you have a text? <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, it's Colossians. He said, yeah, whenever I preach Colossians, I just let Paul preach. And it was like this massive revel- revelation. That, oh, you mean I can get in the pulpit and read this verse and say, well, see, Paul just said that. And then just explain. That's what Paul said, right? And then read the next verse, and Paul, it means this, right? And suddenly, I was so free. Right? My, my conscience was just released. I don't have to make the people believe this. Huh? I just got to say it. Now, it doesn't mean everybody liked what I had to say. Uh, but nonetheless, it was a great freedom to be not the one in charge of the working of the Word of God. This brings us then, you know, he uh, Pieper now quotes Luther a couple of times and uh, as sort of like uh, what at least the Lutheran position on this is. And he has a little little blip of a quote from the hymn, A Mighty Fortress Is Our God, the word they still shall let remain. And if you spend any time in, in Lutheran churches, you find out that there's two translations of this uh, this hymn and they, they got different settings of music. And personally, I find I go back and forth. Like one time I like one verse that's translated a certain way and, and then there's a different part of the other one I like. This is one of those cases where I really like the other translation, where it says, God's word forever shall abide, no thanks to foes who fear it. And and this idea that, look, we're again, we're going to take this position. We're not going to grant you the credit of, of, of having your position be a, a Christian position if you're going to reject the word of God. We're actually going to say there, there's no thanks to you. We're not going to be mad at you about it, but you're, you're not going to move us by you being mad at us. What do you think about that one, Pastor Reese? I, I think that's uh, what you just said is really critical. Um, and I think this is what gets Christians into a lot of trouble, is we, we kind of envision ourselves as being able to have this righteous anger. Um, I've not been able to successfully accomplish righteous anger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whenever I'm angry, I'm usually sinning right along with it. Um, and, and certainly I understand that that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be angry at sin. Uh, we absolutely we should. Um but I, I'm, I'm, I find that when I can come across to a person uh, who is on the other side of the fence with regard to God's Word, and, and I can just basically confess what Scripture says and what I have been given to believe, um, and I can do it uh, almost not, not, not totally dispassionately, but, uh, but objectively to, uh, to the best of my ability, um, w- without getting my emotions 
into it, then when they react with their argument, I don't have to take it personally. Right, right. Um, and so it's, it's good for them because maybe they're going to keep listening to me, and it's good for me because I don't go home with my stomach tied up in knots. Right. It's, it's not that you can't be passionate and that you, you don't care, but you, right. can, you can at least strive for self-control, one of those fruits of the Spirit, uh, yeah, in, in your response. Really, and, it, and it really points to a security in the Word of God itself. It's not, it, the Word of God doesn't need me to go out and defend it. Right. Um, I just need to speak it and confess it, uh, and and the Holy Spirit will will worry about who is going to receive it and who is not. Um, but I I, I like uh, uh, how you put it about the the two different translations of the Mighty Fortress. Um, both have their pros and cons, and I I do appreciate I do also like the stanza four of the the uh, newer the the one with the isn't it's the it's the newer one that's the Bach. Uh, yes, the Bach, Bach one, right, right. Yeah, it's yeah, really exactly. about it's it's too bad you can't mush them together somehow. But the sat, mm-hmm. the problem is they got like a different tempo in there and yeah, you can't it do it. Work. So yeah. so the other quote he has from Luther is when you read the words of Holy Scripture, you must realize that God is speaking them. And I and I think this gets Pastor Reese to where the the comfort that you just mentioned is that when I am and we should not just say read the words of Holy Scripture, but when you hear them confessed, when you when you hear them preached, when you talk about them, you must realize this is God speaking, that he has inhabited us spiritually by these words. Everyone's out there chasing the Holy Spirit, trying to track him down, but he's he's hidden himself in these words so that we might know where he is, so that we might, in fact, have him inside of us and coming out of us again. I know, uh, uh, Pastor Winterson, you've had some experience with uh, those chasing the Spirit in other places. Uh, you got any thoughts on that? Chasing the Spirit in what sense? Oh, like uh, Pentecostal kind of stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I think I think uh, we're, we're, that's always a temptation for us. And uh, uh, from from Adam, the the, the desire to sort of uh, uh, have the spirit in some sense that, that we can control, is, it's, in, it's in us. And, and to find the spirit other than where he has promised and chosen to be is also in us. And, and then one of the foes that uh, is going to let the word remain, whether, whether it wants to or not, is our own sinful flesh. Right. I think the, that temptation that you spoke of, of pastors to, to want to make the word in some sense more effective uh, it's in every single one of us. I mean, uh, we see, so we preach the Word, and, and uh, we preach the Word, and we preach the Word, and, and it seems like uh, we don't see the changes that we want to see, and so we start trying to do other things. And, and in fact, uh, that's, that's a temptation of our sinful flesh to, to try and make the Word of God more effective than, than He uh, once it, then he's going to have it be right, uh, and uh, it's going to do, and and that mm-hmm. freedom that comes from knowing that God's going to do what He says He's going to do, that His Word will not return empty or worthless or not do anything, it will. And so to to simply speak the Word of God and to trust it, I mean that's that's a something that takes practice and it takes uh, it takes kind of a, a continual reminder of that promise in order to do that, but. But uh, as uh, Pastor Rebow says, you know, just just let it do it. Let the word let Paul do, do it. Gonna do. One of, I, I probably say this too often. One of my favorite favorite Bible verses. I, I have a lot of them, I suppose. But but one of the ones that comes to mind often is Saint Paul speaking to to young Pastor Timothy and saying, "Preach the word." in season and out of season. And you think about a crop. You have seasons where the crop is growing, and you got seasons when nothing's going to grow. And cross-reference that with the parable of the sower. He says, it doesn't say, stop throwing the seed out during the time it's out of season. It, just keep throwing the seed. But you can't change the seed. And if you're going to go start sowing tares, now you're on the wrong side of the fence. You're on the other side of the game. Peeper then uh, sums up what Luther uh, has been meaning and kind of pulls a bit of a quote together. He says that Luther warns us uh, that in drastic words that we shall become terrible monsters if we depart from this fountain of all wisdom, which is Scripture. That's that's pretty severe warning, Pastor Gunia. What do you say? 
Yeah, in, in my sermons, the more creative I get, the way, actually the worse I get. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, uh, my, my sermon experiences mirror yours a little bit when I was first learning to preach, and I would, in fact, avoid preaching on Paul because uh, I, I look at it and it's just so clear and it's so laid out. What am I going to say that Paul isn't already saying here? I'm cheaping out on my congregation. Uh, so I would try to preach on some other text, or I would try to get creative, and, you know, I regret doing that. I, I, what I should have been doing, and what I, I think I do more more better now, is uh, I just say what the Scriptures say, and then let the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit's going to do, whether we're in season or whether we're out of season, as you correctly say. Uh, I think it's a great thing that... Uh, I could go to my bookshelf and I could pull off my bookshelf a sermon that's 500 years old, uh, preached to people of an entirely different culture, and it's still relevant today because they're preaching the truth. And the truth of God's Word never changes because the speaker of God's Word, God himself, never changes. Truth is truth. And we do our congregation a great service when we preach to them that unchanging truth and a changing, uh, and a changing world. I could go and, and examine my own life, and I could find a whole collection of discarded ideas and discarded beliefs that I used to hold on to. Uh, some of the things I said 10, 20, 30 years ago, I wouldn't say now because I don't believe it now, and I recognize that they are untruthful. But the Word of God endures forever. It remains truthful, and as I depart from the Word of God, I corrupt the Word of God. You heard it here first on Cross Defense from Pastor Matthew Gunia of Niles, Illinois, that Scripture alone is more better. We'll be back after this break. Yeah, no, the, the nervousness of being on a podcast. Yeah. That's, that's right. We'll be right back. <laughs> Providing solid confessional Lutheran resources for pastors around the world. That's Luther Academy. Logia, the Journal of Lutheran Theology, the 13-volume Confessional Lutheran Dogmatic Series, and global conferences for strengthening pastors. That's Luther Academy. Sign up for our email news and support our efforts at lutheracademy.com or call us at 260-452-2211. Join Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service and thousands of congregations across the country as they observe Refugee Sunday, a time to celebrate the gifts migrants and refugees bring to the United States. Pick a Sunday that works best for your congregation to celebrate. New resource kits, including bulletin insert and poster, will be available soon. Sign up for our newsletter at lirs.org slash rebuildinghope. In the rush and mix of life, it is not always easy to catch your breath, sit for a moment, and remember the goodness of the Lord. With all the demands on your time, how do you fit in His time? That's why we broadcast His time weekday mornings on KFUO. Beginning at 7.15 a.m., we bring His time to you with prayer, devotion, and comfort to help you be still and know that He is God even while stuck in traffic. Underwritten by the Lutheran Federal Credit Union. Freedom. Sojourner Truth, born in slavery around 1797 in New York, became one of the most famous abolitionists of her time. As a child, she had several owners. After 17 years, she escaped with her daughter and was ultimately aided by a Quaker couple who bought her and then freed her. Sojourner spent the rest of her life speaking against slavery. A prolific preacher and speaker, she never learned to read, but that didn't stop her from learning. Over the years, she made sure people read to her, especially from the Bible. By the end of the Civil War, she not only met with President Lincoln, she had petitioned the government to make Western lands available to freed blacks and made countless speeches in support of African Americans and women. Sojourner Truth died November 26, 1883, a free woman. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible. 
KFUO, the messenger of good news. And Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. The message is clear. KFUO. Welcome back to Cross Defense on Worldwide KFUO, the messenger of good news. I'm your host, Pastor Jonathan Fisk, uh, on the phone with Pastor Jeffrey Reese, Pastor Timothy Winterstein, and Pastor Matthew Gunian, Gunia, uh, preachers of the faith in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, talking about the confession that is given to us by Francis Pieper and his Christian dogmatics, but it really is the confession of Christians everywhere, if they're of goodwill and truly understanding our Lord, that Scripture is indeed God's Word. And Pastor Gunia left us off saying that uh, we, in his preaching, whenever he tries to be creative, he ends up causing more trouble to the sermon because he ends up bringing more of himself. And it reminded me of this wonderful line, which has sort of been uh, a... a a motto of mine for my own preaching is St. John the Baptist, when Jesus shows up, says, he must increase, I must decrease. And I've always gone into sermon preparation with just that thought that I need to have less of me and more of Jesus, which means more of God's word in the sermon. What do you think, Pastor Reese? Well, given that one of the secondary themes of the gospel of uh, John the Apostle is to point the followers of uh, John the Baptist to Jesus. You know, you have in John 1, uh, John pointing uh, his followers to Jesus and saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Um, it doesn't get more succinct than that. My, my job as a preacher is, is not to bring my own creativity into it, but trust the creative Word of God to do what it promises to do, um, not to return to him empty quoting Isaiah 55, but to accomplish that for which he has purposed it. Um, and so uh, my job is to do kind of what John the Baptist did and uh, um, uh, point people to Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's just that simple. It's like that great chronic painting of Dr. Luther pointing at the crucified Christ while the people look on over the altar, and I believe that's in Wittenberg. Um, so mm -hmm. Dr. Pieper's now going to shift direction a little bit, and he, he says... Modern theologians substitute their own Christian consciousness for Scripture as the source and norm of theology and claim that this and their highly developed sense of realities based on science keeps them from identifying Scripture as the Word of God. Now, th th those, there's some big words in there. It's a bit convoluted, but it kind of reminds me of another phrase from Dr. Luther where he calls reason a harlot, uh, someone who comes along and would tempt us, that we would look at ourselves as highly developed with a, a sense of reality. you got to have, have like a, a nice uh, elevated uh, accent as you say that. Uh, what do you say, Pastor Winterstein? Are, are you tempted by your sense of reason, or do you find that when you're running into false teaching, it appeals to reason over against Scripture? Well, I mean, it certainly, I think it would have to, right? Because, uh, you know, it's, it, it comes from a person uh, who has, I mean, an unbeliever is not going to accept the things of God, because they're spiritually discerned, Paul says. So, so uh, it would have to, in some sense, appeal to the sense of reason. Usually, it's something where you take a little bit of something from the Bible or from that sounds religiousy and uh, mix it up with uh, with things that make sense to our natural human reason. And then you present that, and people say, "Of course, that's true." Um, uh, you know, I, I think creativity it. it it depends on you know sort of how how we you know obviously anything that comes from me as my own I'm going to to do this and make this more appealing to people because uh, and show how how intelligent and smart I am and how well I can do this that I mean that that's I think one it's a temptation for every preacher and two uh, it goes against the the simple plain word of God which Paul says we're not going to come before you with sort of you know, intelligent, wise words and, and our own human learning, but we're going to give you Christ crucified. Um, at the same time, you know, with the, the, the one who's been trained in the Word of God brings out the old and the new, and so there is a certain sense of, of maybe that kind of 
a submissive creativity where you say, "Hey, where, where, how? Let me, let me examine this word, and you know, it's going to sound like something new and bold, and uh, um, and something that people have never heard, but." It's because it's coming out of the scriptures. It's know, it's a what, fine it's a fine line between translation and innovation, and yeah. you kind of have to dance that that line a bit. I, I totally get you with that, but you don't actually want to you don't actually want to innovate, but you do want to be able to truly communicate. But at the same time, you have people who will use. Uh, translation or communication as an excuse for innovation, right? I think this is where our catechism uh, as Lutherans is so valuable, the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer, so that you know if someone comes along and says something against those, then they are they are most definitely innovating. You, you also mentioned, you know, taking the scriptures, a little bit of scripture here, a little bit of scripture there, and kind of kind of using your reason to make it say what you want. And it, the one that came to mind right away probably because uh, this morning we recorded a thing uh, on, on creationism a little bit, it was that Genesis 1 says that the earth was created in six days, and then they'll jump all the way to, it's either first or second Peter, that for the Lord a day is like a thousand years. And so therefore, they aren't 24-hour days in Genesis chapter 1. Clearly, they must be billions of year uh, day age theory gaps or whatever. And, and what you have then there is, reason trumping scripture, ripping it out from its context and making it to be what we'd prefer to believe. Because nobody would make come up with that idea on their own unless they're trying to defend something their reason already wants to defend, namely in that case, evolution. So so people... Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, it's also anthropomorphizing God, because... Well, you used a big uh, word there. you gotta, you got to say what that word means. I know. Well, yeah, it means we, we treat God as if he's like one of us. And it, I mean, yes, he became a man. Yeah. Uh, and he created us in his image, but we we take that too literally sometimes, uh, and and we want to make it so that God thinks the same way we think, right? Um, and we forget the fact that you know first of all we're not God, and which is a problem that our first parents kind of got into, and 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 second of all, um, uh, we we are our thinking is fallen. You know, and so you can even go again to Isaiah 55, which I quoted earlier. You know, thanks be to God that His thoughts are not our thoughts, or we'd be in a whole mess of trouble. It's interesting though, like that, that just that verse, His thoughts not being our thoughts, is not a result of the fall. The fall made it even worse. So we don't even want to believe right. His thoughts when He tells them to us. But His thoughts aren't our thoughts because He's God. Exactly. Pastor Gunia. Yeah, the the angels don't understand God either, right? So you're right. It's not a part of the fall. Um, yeah, and, and I like your example. It's not so much like a scripture interpreting scripture, but a, a scripture explaining away scripture. Right. Uh, in that example, um, and, and it's to an extent, it's understandable in that uh, when you don't understand the word of God, you try to gravitate toward things that you do understand. Oh, gee, this word of God is difficult. I don't understand how God can create the word world by a spoken word in uh, just six 24-hour days. Or I don't understand how Jesus could say this or what he means there. So I'll go to something that I do understand. Well, I understand myself. I understand my own thoughts. I do a lot of navel-gazing. I, I know what I feel and such. So I'll talk about that instead. Or uh, I don't understand how God can create the world in six days, but I do understand dinosaur bones. And this, uh, this evolution thing is kind of interesting and easy to understand. So I'll talk about that instead. Then you're moving further and further away from the Word of God. Um, and that's just a result of the fact that you're not approaching the Word of God correctly. Uh, the, the Bible does not contain the Word of God mixed in with some, some stuff that man wrote and, and some other admixtures, but rather it is the Word of God, um, the, the Word written by the prophets and the apostles. So the, the word that Pieper uses that really does summarize all the things that we can possibly set against the Word of God is experience right like the you just said a moment ago that your your understanding of something would lead you to question what the scriptures say but all of your understanding is going to come from your own personal experience, or the other phrase he uses is the the sense of reality. That's kind of a, a scholastic way of saying experience, that what you observe has taught you to think certain things, and you come to the Bible with your nature, with your unregenerate nature, assuming that that experience is inerrant, that is infallible, that what you feel 
What you see, what you observe, that can't be questioned, at least so far as you are concerned, that it's it's absolutely right. And yet, any time, just take any time that you, you have an experience with other human beings, we all have different memories of those things. We don't remember things the same way. Every time you're in a, a, a small debate with your wife that turns into a small argument with your wife, you both think something else happened altogether than what's happening. And both of you are wrong, probably, right? So, so our experience has fallen. Our reason is fallen, and yet this amazingly doesn't stop some Christians from questioning Scripture based upon experience. Yeah, I uh, it just it just struck me in the in the uh, formula of Concord uh, directly related to this: the the presence, effectiveness, and gift of the Holy Spirit should not and cannot always be assessed uh, from the sense of it or as a person feels it in the heart. Uh, instead, because the Holy Spirit's activity is often hidden under the cover of great weakness, right. we have to be certain uh, that it's a, that it's according to the promise, uh, and it's a function of and work of the Holy Spirit, and that comes from outside of us, and it's according to a promise and not according to how we feel, which always goes up and down. And I think that that's it's so significant in our in our culture, where everybody almost everybody starts a sentence with, "Well, I feel that." And, uh, well, that goes up and down, and everybody has different feelings and different experiences. And so so if we're going to determine where the Holy Spirit is working based on that, uh, we're, we're going to be confused and lost. Right. The Holy Spirit told well, me to tell you that, that you need to do this. And I come back, well, the Holy Spirit told me to tell you that he told me to tell you that you needed to do this, right? <laughs> who, who ends up winning? Go ahead, Pastor Reese. Well, also, do, isn't it interesting also that the Holy Spirit only tends to show up in things that we find really positive and exciting and, uh, you know, that, that manifest positive emotions? Yes, um, at least know, in, in the way that we would talk about it, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is a, a thing that uh, really has bothered me for a long time because I can't tell you how many people I have run across who aren't going to church because they, they don't want baggage or their shame. Oh, it sounds like we lost you there, Pastor Reese. Sounds like he's gone there. So uh, hopefully he comes back in a moment. And uh, we're going to keep on going here, though. So the baggage of church, and maybe this what he's getting at there, guys, is is the theology of the cross, which would see God in suffering, uh, that, that the Christian could see in the crucified Savior, one who, who does not believe God has abandoned him because of the cross, but in fact still trusts in God's word to him anyway. Yeah. Yeah, the promise. The promise. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, we're created with feelings. We, we, as, as creatures, we have emotion and feeling and experience. And, and but the problem is that doesn't always line up with the Word of God because His thoughts are not our thoughts and His ways are not our ways because we're creatures and He's God uh, and the Creator. They don't always line up, and so we have to have some a baseline that's not in us, which is constantly going up and down. Uh, if you have a baseline that's constantly moving, you you can't ever be certain. And uh, the Lord wants us to be certain. He wants us to be certain of His love and His mercy in Christ for us. And so, as you said earlier, uh, He tells us uh, where He can be found in the preach word, in the absolution, in the baptism, in the supper, so that we don't have to go looking and searching and wonder have we found God or not. He comes and finds us, and so that we have the certainty. And we don't have to go constantly be on this roller coaster of, of human experience. Far from being a discomfort, too. I think people are afraid that that's discomforting, that it's rigid and it's cold. But far from that, it is just such a freedom to know that when the supper is given to me, when, it, when the pastor says what Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood, I can sit there and I can have half of me, 100% of half of me being like, that looks like bread and wine to me and this doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And then I can have 100% of the other half of me saying, dear Lord, help my unbelief. I want to believe this because I need this forgiveness. And I can be confident that that word outside of me is stronger than the doubt within me. And that is in fact there to put that doubt to death and to raise the faith in me to life. And that baptism is the same thing. The promise of absolution is the same thing. The scriptures work the exact same way. It is so comforting to have that confidence. Uh, Pastor Guni, you got a thought? 
Uh, yeah, well, with all this talk about experience, it, it, you're approaching the scriptures and you see what the scripture says. Yes, but my experience tells me something slightly different. And then his experience tells him slightly something slightly different. It's uh, everyone and their dog has their own unique experience. But what they're really saying when they appeal to their experience is my experience is the normative experience. And you should listen to me, and you should take into account what I say and what I feel and what I've researched and and all of this other stuff, and you should adopt it as your own as well, or at least uh, say that it's a legitimate experience. Um, But what is the normative thing? It is the Word of God, as you say. Uh, My experience tells me that that is just bread, that's just wine, that's just water. But the experience of the Word of God is that it is more than bread, more than wine, more than water. It is a means of grace, the means by which God forgives your sins and strengthens your faith. Isn't it funny how those who who would say to you that all experiences are, are a way to truth and there is no real truth and all the words really don't have meaning, we can't really understand each other, but it's each of us is good for each of us and whatever, they expect you to take all those words at face value with pure meaning and truth when they say them and, 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 and claim for themselves the very thing they're trying to take from everybody else? Yeah, they, they are very... I, I mean, I find that people are very certain about their own perspectives uh we saw i saw this uh uh, uh kind of a famous i'm not going to say the person's name but kind of a famous uh person uh written some books and things and lots of people uh follow this person said uh well here's a story about this person's experience but that's not the only story here are some other stories about somebody else's opposite experience uh clearly this person did not want uh, her readers to 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 follow the one story, but instead to follow the other stories. Well, who is to say that one person's experience? Then, you know, let's turn that around. Who is to say one person's experience is greater than another person's experience? That we should follow that experience rather than another one. We have to. We've got to have something outside of all of us. That's just it. So what what we do as Christians, as, as Lutheran Christians, is that we take the experience of the 12 apostles as eyewitnesses of the resurrected Jesus and as sent witnesses of the resurrected Jesus to be the experience of the resurrected Jesus. And in that way, we trust their experience over our own. Um, I'm going to see if Pastor Reese is here again. He, he thinks he's still with us. Uh, can, I'm still here. There you are. Good. Now, you were talking about uh, church and suffering, and I, I don't want to miss that. Yeah, where where did you lose me? I just said right away as soon as you started talking. Okay. Wow. Well, I just said, isn't? Are you still there? Yep. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just said, isn't it interesting how the Holy Spirit only shows up in uh, experiences that are positive or that emotionally make me feel good? Um, we we are convinced that it's a Holy Spirit when something goes the way that we find good. Uh, but I don't hear a lot of talk about the Holy Spirit being present when things suck. Right. Um, and and so, you know, I, I can't tell you how many people I've run across who claim Christianity but haven't been in church in years because they're suffering from depression or there's some sort of deep guilt or shame in their life and, and they don't want to come to church because they don't want to... It, it's too hard to be in this environment where they're expected to be positive and happy or they just simply feel guilty about bringing other people down with their uh, sad or... Um, angry or whatever negative emotions um and one of the things we really try to emphasize here in my congregation is that church is the great uh equalizer you know you can come in and be having your best day or you can be having your worst day and you're both going to speak the same confession of sins and you're both going to receive the same holy absolution you're both going to come before the altar of the Lord as poor, miserable, broken sinners receiving his body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. Because even if you're having your best day ever, you still know uh, that you're fallen and that you that you need the grace of God. I don't entirely um, have it out for the for the hymn, I am Jesus, little lamb. There's there's some mm-hmm. true theology in it, but I cannot stand the line ever glad of heart I am, because it's a lie. And to try to tell our children that this is what they should expect from church is just a great danger, because what happens when we teach them that spirituality is about gladness, and that they find that Christianity doesn't make them glad, they're going to go off and look for gladness wherever they can. If we teach people that 
all that matters is, to, is that you had fun, which I've heard this said from Christians to their kids just in general. If, if that's really the true statement, then what happens when church or, or life or truth is no longer fun? I'm just so glad my children are happy. Well, that might be true for their temporal life, but what happens on the day of judgment when their happiness eats their flesh like fire? As James says, our riches will do to us if we're outside of the blood of Christ. It's, it's quite terrifying, really, what this need for, if we can call it joy, I don't think it's the joy the scriptures speak of, it's the, it's the pursuit of happiness that's part of the American ethos, uh, the danger this represents to us when we replace scripture alone with that. Yeah, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Um, and being poor in spirit is not a happy place to be. Uh, it, it, it is not a, uh, a intrinsically good place to be. In, in, I mean, in, it's not a good place to be in the sense of your experience of it. Uh, it's, a, it's a poor, miserable place to be. And yet, blessed are the poor in spirit. The experience of those who base their faith on anything else but Scripture and seek to derive the knowledge of the truth from their own hearts is a delusion. I mean, them's some fighting words right there, Pastor Gunya. Well, they they are. Uh, We've been talking a lot about experience, 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 mine, yours, someone else's. And, you know, Pastor Fisk, I love you, but I don't really care much about your experience. (laughs) Um, What I care about is what Jesus experienced. Uh, He's the one who took our sin upon himself, and he died our death. He's the one who closed hell to us and opened heaven to us. He's the one who ascended into heaven and yet is still with us, and he's the one who who forgives our sins through the means of grace. Uh, The scripture shows us Jesus. It's that experience that I care about, the experience of Jesus Christ. Scripture is the sole basis for faith, Pieper says. Christ tells us clearly that only through his word can men learn the truth. If you continue in my word, you will know the truth. And there he is quoting scripture. So we have these two things. We have truth and we have delusionalism. Pastor Winterstein? Yeah, I think that it, it, it's fascinating to me because we, uh, I just saw quotes, I forget who said it the other day, that something about um, the, the evidence of sin, which should be the most obvious to everybody, is the thing that everybody denies. And so even... Uh, n- even before we get to the truth and the revelation of Christ as our Savior, which has to be revealed to us, we also, also the scriptures reveal to us how deep our sinfulness is, because we don't, we're never going to believe that. We, we tend to, okay, I made some mistakes, yeah, I, I, really, I kind of messed this up, but, but deep down there's something good in me that, that I just need to kind of work on that. Um, the scriptures reveal that there's nothing good in us at all, and therefore they can reveal that Christ is our only good. And, and I, the delusion that there's, that there's something in me that's good, uh, and that, I just, that, that maybe church is the way that I kind of uh, feed that so, that so that I can be better, uh, that's, that's going to all, all, cause all sorts of problems. And really the experience, I mean, it, it, seeps, into, it seeps into everything in, in American Christianity, um, that when I leave church, I need to have uh, I need to have had some experience that makes me feel this. And when I don't feel that, then I didn't get anything out of it. Then it wasn't worth anything. And and uh, then so then we change the things that we do so that we feel something good when we leave. And and that's that's just not you. You may or you may not. That's just not. That can't be the basis of what we're doing in the divine service where God is giving us his gifts. It's, it's interesting, the way you said that, at least early on, made me, made me think about, it really does all come back to justification, and that scripture, is that one of you guys maybe? Because it's not me. <laughs> uh, scripture is in fact its own, uh, me, the argument over scripture being trustworthy or whether my experience is valuable becomes an argument over whether I am justifying my experience or being justified by what scripture says, right? So that even those who would say, I believe in justification, as there's Lutherans out there, I believe in justification by grace through faith, but scripture is not inerrant. Well, then they begin on this route of having to justify themselves in their rejection of scripture. And the beauty of, of the Word of God being the active thing is that I can leave church having just gone through the motions and not really having had any kind of experience that I found positive or not feeling better about myself or whatever. 
and still know that the Word of God worked its will in me, that you know, worked its way in me, and, and, did, and did what it promises. That is the beauty. It wasn't, depend- it wasn't dependent upon me, and so I can, I can be comforted by that. It is the beauty of the Lord's Supper. It doesn't miss. It's the beauty of baptism. It doesn't miss. Mm-hmm. And when you are catechizing the faith, not just going to listen to the sermon as an entertainment, but over time, that Lord's Prayer repeated over and over again, going deep into you, it's always there. Yeah, you can always call it back up. The creed is always there. And we know that where Scripture is, life is mo better, as Pastor Gunia has, has taught us earlier today. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being on Cross Defense with me today. I'm Pastor Jonathan Fisk. I've had with me Pastor Jeffrey Reese, Pastor Timothy Winterstein, and Pastor Matthew Gunia, uh, classmates of mine, good friends, and we'll be having them back on fairly regularly here on KFUO, the messenger of good news. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. We'll catch you on the other side. Rock on.